Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's early morning out here on the West Coast. Uh, uh, good morning, East Coast, and uh, good day wherever else you are. Um, I'm Scott Roselle. I'm the co-director of SKY, the Stanford Center of Economics and Institutions at Stanford University. And uh, um, today we're doing a, um, a new feature here at Big Data China, which is the collaboration between CSIS. So you'll get to see meet Scott Kennedy, my my longtime colleague and and the trustee chair at at CSIS, um, and uh, and his team that have done a fantastic job of of bringing together uh, people to talk about today's event, assessing the state of the private sector in China, a big data China event, and um, at this time in in the world's. Uh, 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 goings on. Um, this is a very, very important um, uh, topic, and I'm looking for. I, I got my pen out. I'm ready to take notes. So, um, welcome everyone. I'm going to take you over, and uh, Scott Kennedy is going to moderate the session. And with, with again, a, a team of super, super, um, um, sort of informed and uh, insightful people. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Well. Um... Scott Roselle, thank you so much for partnering with us. There's two Scots in the program today, and you just heard from the smart one. Um, now it's over to me, and so you'll have to suffer through the rest of the hour, me, me, me handling handling all of this. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I think most folks who are watching are have heard of this idea of the advance of the state and the retreat of the private sector in Chinese, Guo Jin Min Tui which refers to increasing support for state-owned enterprises and them playing a larger role in the economy in the last few years. Although that says something about where China has come in the last few years that's accurate, those standard interpretations don't really capture the entire story of the significance of the state-owned sector in China's economy. It matters a lot the role of the state in the economy uh, because it would have an effect on China's growth rate because we know that state-owned enterprises typically are less efficient than their private cousins. It also matters for how the rest of the world interacts with China's economy because China has a unique and distinctive economic system that affects how we cooperate and compete with each other. It also potentially has implications for national security because of the way state-owned enterprises operate, the relationship with the Chinese state, and depending on what industries they're in, that could make a big difference. But standard interpretations, as I said, don't capture the entire story. But luckily, there have been a group of scholars who have been working hard on this problem using unique methods and new data sets to get a better handle on what the full scope of the state sector is. We have one of those uh, pathbreaking researchers with us today that I'm going to introduce in just a second, Chang Tai Xie. And then we have a group of other leading experts on China's economy who are also going to join us to offer feedback on this new pathbreaking research and what it means from their various perspectives. So I'm going to introduce Chang Tai now. And he's going to make a presentation of about 10 minutes. He's going to pass the baton back to me. And then I'm going to introduce our five colleagues who are going to offer comments and feedback on his uh, research. And then we'll have a discussion with each other. All of you who are watching online live can, on the website, submit questions uh, about this research and the topic. They'll come to me, and I will be your voice to share those questions with our experts. Chang Tai Xie is the Phyllis and Irwin Winkelried Distinguished Service Professor of Economics and the PCL Faculty Scholar at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He conducts research on growth and development around the world and particularly on China. He has published in every leading academic journal he possibly could. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, and the Academia Sinica. And he's a recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellowship. 
Chang Tai, we are really grateful for all the hard work and sweat that you and your colleagues in the United States and China have put into this work. And we really look forward to having you uh, share your research with everybody today. Over to you. Thank you, Scott. Um, let me start by just um, summarizing what I think the story is. That I think that this the typical framing of of China is the battle between the private sector and the state sector, or uh, the state advances and the private sector retreats. I think it 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 it, uh, it misleads us more than it illuminates the way we should be thinking about what has happened and what is happening in China. In, in some sense, I think it's it uh, it is really a red herring. Let me try to make that point by telling you a story of a visit that I made uh, to with with uh, some of my collaborators to this small city in southern China. So it's a city of about two million people. This is the summer of 2013. Um, so this is this is the city where I, I am sure, with maybe the, the exception of Scott, you will not have heard of the city. But it's in cities like this where I think a lot of the action is taking place. And um, so we went to the city because we knew somebody there who was a vice mayor of the education department, right, in 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 the uh, local government. And we went there because we wanted to put together just documentation of what local governments in China do. And we had a way in because we, we had a personal connection. So we, we got to the office of the vice mayor. So just, just remember again, this is the office of the vice mayor of education. Um, and we got to uh, this person's office at 10 o'clock in the morning. And we were met by his chief of staff. Uh, and his chief of staff apologized, said that, the vice mayor was looking forward to meeting us and, and uh, that day, but uh, two important people had to come to town and he was gonna try his best to see us, but he couldn't. So nothing that we could do. So we sat down and started to talk with the chief of staff of the vice mayor's office and just talking about what the vice mayor's office does. And at 10.30 in the morning after chatting and uh, he and uh, 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 he handed us this flow chart, which I am reproducing here, where, and he proudly say, told, told us, this flow chart summarizes what we do, okay? What the vice mayor's office for education does. So most of you should be able to read this, but, but for those of you that can't, I, uh, I am uh, providing my rough translation. And it says that what the vice mayor's office for education does is that we actively look for quality prospects. We have a discussion to learn about the investor. We undertake a feasibility analysis. We identify land and other needed services. Whatever it is that they're talking about goes for the approval of the vice mayor and then they sign the agreement. And for anybody that has ever done anything in China outside of Beijing and Shanghai, you will know exactly what this person is talking about. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, that what what you're going to find, and this is no mystery to anybody that has ever done business, is that in that time period, in 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 the late in the late uh, in the late uh, 2010, or in 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 the late 2000s and the early 2010s, whenever you go to any local government in China, what you're going to find is that they are spending all of their time doing this. And what is this? This is basically, you know, what are the quality prospects that they're talking about? What they're doing is that they they are looking to bring private businesses into the city. That's what the quality prospect is. If this looks like what an investment banker, if this looks or, or what a private equity fund does, you know, you wouldn't be that far from the truth uh, that this is what, what they do. So they undertake, they do their due diligence to learn about uh, the in, in to, to do to learn about the investor, and they figure out what they need to do in order to get this person to set up in their city. And once this person sets up in their city, then they basically are uh, uh, do whatever they can to make sure that this person uh, or this business needs whatever uh, whatever the, the business needs in in, uh, in order to grow. They get it. 
And what we were able to document during our time there is that this is what every single part of the local party apparatus is doing. You know, anywhere, you know, so this is the vice mayor's office for education, but this is what you see the population and housing bureau. So you think that, that what they're doing is implementing the one child policy? You know, that's not what they're doing with their time. So every single part of the local party apparatus is doing this. And just to be clear, the, the quality prospects are private firms. I mean, they are spending all of their time uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to make sure that 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 the uh, that these uh, private that these uh, private investors get set up in their city, uh, and and then they and they have whatever they they need in order to survive. It's not the state-owned firms. I mean, they are obviously state local state-owned firms here, but that's not what they're focused. Uh, 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 what uh, they are, what, what uh, they are focused on. So the way I think, I mean. That the way I think about China, you know, that that it's really about, you know, it's not about the state, it's not about the private sector, but it's about building these partnerships, building these, or maybe another way, way to say this is that it's all these shades of gray. It's not white, it's not black, but it's about building these partnerships and whether it's been able to, and 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 I think that that. China has been has been able to, to grow quickly when it's been able to build up these partnerships or when these partnerships expand to sectors of the economy and to and to the firms where previously it was not possible. And 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 the economy slows down. And I think this is sort of what we're seeing now when they're not able when 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 these partnerships start to come, uh, 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 they start to come apart. So. Now let, let me get to the the work that that Scott was talking about. What then we we try to do is to is to put numbers to these partnerships by looking at the equity relationships uh, between between the private sector and agents of the state. And let me illustrate that with. Looking, but by, by by just illustrating what a very typical ownership structure looks like. We started a long time ago to look at this company called the East Hope Group, or in particular East Hope Aluminum. And the reason that we started to look at this group was because we were looking at trying to understand what happened to the first incarnation of Chinese industrial policy, where they designated sixteen. Uh, strategic sectors and that these these uh, 16 sectors were only to be reserved for for essentially designated state-owned firms one of these sectors was aluminum and the according to the rules of official chinese industrial policy only this one state-owned firm the china aluminum corporation was allowed to produce aluminum we started to follow this company called the east hope group called the east hope uh, uh, the east hope aluminum because they were setting up a big aluminum operation in clear violation of the rules of of uh, of, uh, of uh, Chinese industrial policy. They were able to do so because they basically entered into a partnership with a Chinese local government that happened to sit on the largest reserves of bauxite in uh, China. So that, that so that's why we started to look at this group. Then we started to dive in more into the ownership structure of this company. So let me just illustrate one part of this. So here, what I'm showing you are two companies, two aluminum companies owned by the East Hope Group. The, the company that's called East Hope Aluminum, what you're gonna find in this company is that it's owned by a bunch of holding shells. And that's very standard when you look at large Chinese private companies. So one issue that one is gonna have whenever you, do, you, you are trying to figure out who owns uh, private Chinese firms is that they're almost always are hidden by, 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 uh, by a layer of uh, Panama Papers to type of corporations, right? The thing about about the Chinese data is that Panama Papers type of corporations have to be legally registered. So if you have the data, it's not that hard to penetrate the. Panama Papers that type of uh, companies in China. So what you're going to find is that. The East Hope Aluminum is owned by four uh, holding shells. So these are the circles that are in light gray. And then what 
what you find as you work your way through these holding shells is that these holding shells are 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 essentially owned by this person called Mr. Liu and his son, right? His son. So, in so this is the data as of 2019, and then what you can say is that East Hope Aluminum then is 100% owned by these two individuals. But look at this other company. This uh, this other company called Samin Sha Da Chang Mining. What is the ownership structure of that company? Well, there the company is owned by two. It's it's owned by three other uh, companies. These, as best as we can tell, are not shells, but they actually are real companies. One of the companies is this company called Mianqi uh, Mining, which itself is owned by two of the same holding shells that also own East Hope that also own East Hope uh, Aluminum. But the other owners are, one of them is another large private uh, uh, private conglomerate, and then the other equity owners and uh, are five state-owned firms, five local state, five local state, uh, uh, five lo lo uh, local state-owned firms. And this is gonna be a very typical structure that you see. So to just zoom out a bit and just get you to see sort of the broader structure, of the East Hope Group. There are 236 companies in the East Hope Group. The companies that I'm highlighting here are just two of them. Um, of the 236 companies in the East Hope Group, 15 of them are joint ventures with the state, with, with state of and what, what I mean by joint ventures is that there is some equity ownership of these 15, um, uh, of these uh, 15 uh, uh, companies by uh, with, with by entities of the state. What you almost always find is that whenever you look at companies like the East Hope Group, it is almost always the case that A, they have these equity, they have some companies that, that are joint ventures with, with some entity of the state. Second, what, what you're gonna find is that these companies it's typically just a small part of the whole enterprise. Okay, so let me just 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 move back up even more and just get you to see sort of the, the full picture of this. So again, this is data from 2019, and just to get you the, the so, sort of a bigger sense, this is something that you you prime that you see among the largest owners in China, and you typically don't see it, or you will see it less and less as you move down the size distribution. So, so what this table is, is basically saying, let's look at the, the, the 100 largest firms in, in China. 63 of them are, are state-owned firms, 37 of them are private firms. Of the 63 state firms, every single one of them has joint ventures with somebody, with some private company. So every single one of the, if you look at the, the 37 largest private owners, 34 of them do. If you move further down the distribution, if you look at the hundred, the, the if you look, look at the the the, the top one hundred thousand uh, Chinese firms, uh, six thousand eight hundred of them are state are state firms, and maybe something like eighty percent of them have joint ventures with with the private sector. Of the ninety three thousand private firms that are in the top hundred thousand. Typically, what you have is a it's it's uh, in 2019 it's about 60 percent, right? And that's uh, so among the large firms. Uh, maybe the way to think about it is that you know I think this this notion that that somebody that a firm is a state so a firm is a state or is private, I think that's not a useful way of thinking about it. That that it's really about these shades of gray. That every firm is a shade of gray. At least when you look at the largest firm, nothing is fully state, nothing is fully private. It's all this mix of the two. It's all this mix of the two. And now let me just end by just showing you the evolution over time. So the evolution over the 20 year period from 2000 to, to uh, 2019. The first column, so, so the way I'm measuring this is that I'm looking at all the owners, and I'm basically measuring what is their registered capital once you make your way throughout this entire ownership structure for the private. Uh, so the first column just shows what, what people have documented, that over this period, the share of private firms has 
has gone up and in our data in the data with the uh, our in our registration capital that number is about 16 percent then the next two columns basically uh uh or the, the the column in the middle breaks that down into okay if you if we now restrict the sample to private owners that have these equity partnerships with state owners uh how much does that go up right and there, the number is that it used to be at eighteen percent in two thousand, and it's gone up to thirty-five percent. So what you see here is that it is that all of the growth, uh, uh, all of the growth of the private sector in China is coming from the growth of what I'm going to call connected private owners. That is, private owners that have built these partnerships uh, with uh, are, uh, uh, with the state. The last column just shows you. Uh, the equity share of the state owners that have built up these ties with uh, with with the uh, with with uh, private firms, and you can see that what you see is that yes, they have built up these ties with the state, but their share is falling. Their share is falling. So the way to think about it is, is that you know their role I think is critical, but 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 I think about what 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 has happened is that it's about building these partnerships so that the state has something so that uh, has something that the private sector needs and then the private sector builds these ties because there's something so think about the the to think about the private investors that went to the small city in China that 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 I uh, described at the at the beginning they sought out the local vice mayors because there was something critical that they needed from the vice mayors but then once they got that support, that resource, that enabled their growth, and their and the extent to which they grew was much much larger than the growth of the state actors that enabled their growth in the first place. So it's really about, I think, you know, it it's it um, I, I, again. I mean, let, 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 let me just come back uh, to to just say that this notion that the way to think about China is that the state advances and and the uh, and uh, the private sector retreats, or the other way around. If uh, if you're thinking about the 1990s and the 2000s, I think that misleads us more than illuminates us in terms of how we should be thinking about China. Let, just let me let me just say 30 seconds because I think it's 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 really important. I think that I think the important question now is what are the political ramifications of this this particular model. And the way I think about what I see happening in the last five years is that the danger, the political danger, is not so much about the political control of the state over the private sector, but it's about the fear of the party about the political control of the private sector over the state. That is, once you've built up these partnerships, so think about the local vice mayors in this no-name city, you know, that, 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 that the question is, what is the political or the fear about what, about the political loyalty of all of these agents of the party once they are critical people in this business infrastructure? Do they owe their loyalty to the party or do they owe their loyalty to these uh, billion-dollar Businesses, do you care more about being loyal to the party, or do you care about the businesses that depend uh, critically on you? So, and I think that that's part of the uh, that's part of the political reaction to you know to the model that I am describing. And so, I think that the fear is is and and, and the political backlash is really about. The fear of the, of the control of the private sector over the party, and not the other way around. All right, so I'll end here. Well, thank you so much, Chang Tai. Uh, really, this is incredible research, and you've really you uh, Chong Bayan and the others who are part of this uh, group have have done a, a real service. Uh, let me introduce the four commentators that we have, all of them, and then I'll I'll start. I'll go to each of them for, for their reactions. Uh, we have four great, fantastic experts I wanna introduce right now who are gonna offer their feedback. 
Uh, the first is uh, my colleague here uh, in the trustee chair, uh, Alaria Mazzocco, who's a senior fellow uh, here at CSIS in our program. She has over a decade of experience researching industrial policy, climate policy, and the intersection between the energy transition, the economy, and national security. And she oversees the day-to-day -day work of the Big Data China Project. And she's an auth the author of a feature that we issued just yesterday on this topic, pulling together the research of Chang Tai and others in this field and analyzing uh, what the policy implications of all of that work are. We also have with us Camille Bouillonois, who is an associate director with Rhodium Group's China Projects team, where she works on the analysis of China's economic system, industrial policy, and market reform. And before joining Rhodium, Camille headed the Brussels office for Sinolytics, advising clients on market governance and data strategies, as well as the regulatory challenges arising from the Chinese corporate social credit system. Tian Lei Huang is a research fellow and the China program coordinator at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He joined the Peterson Institute as a research analyst in March of 2019, and he works on issues related to China's economy, particularly issues of development. Before joining Peterson, Huang worked at the Brookings Institution Center for East Asian Policy Studies, where he focused on China ASEAN economic relations and cross strait ties. And then finally, we have with us Joyce Chang, who is chair of global research for JP Morgan's Corporate and Investment Bank. Joyce was managing director at Merrill Lynch and Solomon Brothers prior to joining JP Morgan Chase in 1999. She has been named as one of the top 25 most powerful women in finance by American Banker since 2012 and was included in Barron's 2020 and 2021 lists of the 100 most influential women in finance. We have a powerhouse team with us to offer feedback on this important area. So I'm going to first turn to Alaria because you've put spent the last few months getting your arms around this research. Uh, which you summed up in a fantastic feature that we we just issued on the Big Data China uh, microsite. And you've also thought a lot about the policy implications of this as well. So what are your thoughts about uh, this area of work and its implications for how we ought to think about how the rest of the world should look at China? Well, thank you, Scott. Um, first of all, I was going to thank uh, both uh, Professor Chang Tai Xie and, and our fantastic panelists for joining us. It's it's a little daunting to speak <laughs> in the midst of all this uh, expertise. But let me just say that I was quite, I mean, I'm always excited for our Big Data China features, but I was especially excited a bit about this research because right now in Washington, there's so much um, um, debate over exactly how to deal with Chinese companies as they're going abroad, how to categorize them, how to understand the risk, how to understand the uh, potential distortions that they're bringing to the markets. And so I think, you know, having um, a, a deeper conversation about exactly how um, the political economy uh, environment in China shapes uh, companies, the whether or not private versus state owned is is the right categorization, and how to think about companies if that is not the right categorization. I thought was was really interesting and and uh, powerful. Um, and and to that end, uh, Professor Xie's research was uh, really helpful, although really complicated. I think in many ways, my understanding of these of these issues as well. Um, so in the future, we. Uh, well, we, I mostly, but with, with the help of this, our fantastic team, uh, Ryan Federson in particular, uh, tried to draw on, on um, uh, several different pa recent papers that have been uh, done on this. And all of them seem to point to the fact that our uh, official data on SOEs is is a bit inadequate, right? It's either it's it's um, not well updated. Uh, it doesn't capture this complicated relationship that Professor Xie just uh, just outlined. Uh, it doesn't really give us um, 
the, the sense of the scope of the of the interconnectedness. So we tried to give a bit of a sense of how others are thinking about this and the numbers and quantifications that they've come up with, uh, which uh, you know the, the, are, uh, point to a much larger number of, of companies that may be defined as linked to the state in some ways or you know state owned, uh, straight up state owned, right? Uh, in addition to that, uh, I think the, the the real question and that's the core question is what does it mean politically? Right. We know, I think there's no doubt that in, from, from this research or in general that, you know, there are significant state linkages that provide sort of an economic uh, advantage in some cases, uh, although there may be some, you know, liabilities as well connected to this because of the type of political pressure that might come from it. Uh, but the, the what does it mean for U.S. national security? Uh, what does it mean in terms of how much the state actually decides what the company does does on a day-to-day -day basis that is not clear um and i think that is sort of the that continues to be a sort of a question mark that i think would uh, uh in many cases benefit chinese companies if they were able to provide a clear answer to that but i think the the part of the problem is that there is no clear answer and it really sort of depends um uh, on the the situation so i i think that's that's all you know to say that it is a very complicated uh, environment. I, um, you know, I when when talking about uh, uh, policy recommendations, one of the first uh, recommendations that I made was that actually we try and continue to pursue uh, transparency policies uh, and and try and get companies to be as transparent as possible in terms of their uh, corporate structure, uh, in terms of uh, you know the 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 types of activities that they're doing that may have political implications, etc. This would benefit companies. It would benefit um, you know governments. To to a certain extent, uh, and and I think there there's actually a lot of uh, leverage that the U.S. government has in terms of uh, of uh, of requesting those kinds of um, that kind of transparency. So that was one of my main conclusions. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to speak too much. I know we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, very informed uh, you know, comments that are coming up, but uh, I look forward to hearing more from others. Well, thank you, Alari. That's a very good um, summary of some of the basic findings and 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 big implications and 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 why Washington ought to pay attention and also some things that China might do the question about transparency and opacity and how to evaluate different Chinese companies is is important for governments it's also important for investors and everyone that's just trying to understand where China is is going so I want to turn to Camille now because you uh at Rhodium and before advise companies and you have to analyze and get your arms around where industrial policy is going. What does all of this mean for the type of work that you do and the people and the companies that you work with? Hi. Um, yes, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to add a few observations that really echo uh, the fantastic research that, that we've heard about. Um, the first one is that there has been a markedly stronger involvement of the state in the post-COVID period uh, to support manufacturing companies. Um, we've seen, for example, the proportion of loans um, at below benchmark rates going up a lot. Um, we've seen companies' investment activity increasing, uh, increasingly unrelated um, to you know, how much they can sell. Um, and, and many other indicators uh, pointing in the same direction here. And so that may be partly because of a real desire by the state to lean more into, into the market. Uh, but honestly, I think it's also, and perhaps even more, um, a reflection of China's economic difficulties in the past few years, where the government felt that a heavier intervention in the economy was really the only policy option it had. Um, and so the, the second observation following that is that that government intervention in the economy is increasingly taking the form of stronger control over commercial actors. Um, and that means, for example, tightening uh, control over the financial sector. Uh, that means sending stronger signals um, that private companies are expected to invest um, in areas that the government labels as um, you know, the so-called new productive forces. Um, and so this is increasingly blurring the distinction, um, as we said, between SOEs and non-SOEs. First of all, because a lot of these new productive forces are in fact private companies. I mean, think EVs, for example. Um, and also because with tighter control, the government wants them to 
behave actually a lot more like SOEs. And so, and, and we actually see indications in the data that this is already happening. Uh, so we see, for example, private companies uh, closing the, the gap with SOEs in terms of how much they get in, in government grants um, in many sectors. Um, another example that I found really interesting is that historically SOEs were a lot more likely to be uh, loss-making than private companies because the government would uh, keep them alive even if they, they didn't perform well. And, and that gap has narrowed quite significantly um, in the past few years. Um, and in, in fact, last year, SOEs were almost as likely to be a loss making as non-SOEs, which I think tells you something about um, the, how, how blurry the lines um, have become. Um, and so I see two major policy implications from that. The first one is that uh, China's government intervention um, has focused heavily on supporting companies at the expense of consumers. And that's, that, that is really creating um, and has created a large and pro growing imbalance between domestic supply and domestic demand. And it, that, that imbalance or that uh, sort of um, excess supply has to be absorbed by other countries. And I think we're, we're really now reaching a tipping point um, where that domestic imba imbalance has become so massive that it's setting China on a course of trade confrontation with the rest of the world. And the second implication, um, specifically of the, the blurring of the lines between SOEs and private companies, is that it's even more difficult than before to, um, to draw a line between what's state controlled or state connected and what's not. And so, um, and, and both at the sectoral level and the company level, and I think that makes it very difficult for, for foreign governments uh, to respond through existing trade defense tools. Um, and to me, it's increasingly clear that those distortions are systemic in nature and they will have to be addressed in a systemic way so I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks. That's really, really interesting, Camille. Thank you so much. It, it has got me further to thinking about who is changing whom. Are we seeing the SOEization of private companies or the privatization of SOEs? Or it's obviously it sounds like it's a little bit going both directions and we're getting a different kind of organism than we had even before that. Uh, which is which is just fascinating, and yes, it gets to the question of can you, with trade restrictions, uh, anti-dumping, export controls, how do you target specific individual institutions given how complex they are? Hey, Tian Lei, I want to bring you into this because you've followed China from the perspective of trying to understand what makes a, a country develop or run into problems, but you also look at China's economic relationship with its neighbors. Um, how does this research affect how you think about China's economy and its place in the world? Thank you, Scott. Uh, it's a great pleasure to join this amazing panel. I think Professor Xie's research is just uh, absolutely fascinating. I'm going to pick a slightly different angle. I think it highlights a very important aspect of the very Chinese growth model, which is about the outsized role of local governments and local officials in promoting economic growth. You know, local officials were so active in promoting economic growth for a couple of reasons. On a personal level, there is a strong motivation for them to compete with their peers in other jurisdictions uh, and ultimately to get promoted to higher level positions. We're all very familiar with this uh, uh, promotion tournament model theory put forward by some Chinese scholars. And on the government level, local governments, given the Chinese fiscal system, local governments have a lot of spending responsibilities, but not necessarily enough resources. Right? So they're always very active in looking for new sources of revenues, including from forging such special deal connections with local private, private firms that, that is discussed uh, in Professor Xie's research. And increasingly over time, there is also an industrial policy element to this, right? We see uh, more and more local governments themselves are becoming very active investors in 
um, new technologies, emerging industries, right? Sometimes through their um, various government guidance funds. By the way, the emergence of those guidance funds is making this blurry distinction between what is state and what is private that Professor Shi discussed even more blurry uh, now, uh, especially because you know those funds usually invest in the private market, so it's it's simply harder for the outside world to track their activity. You know this model based on um, competition among local officials um, definitely enabled China to grow at a rapid uh, uh, rate for uh, a long time. But it is also a source of the many problems and distortions that the Chinese economy is suffering from today. Let me just name a few of them. Uh, the accumulation of massive off-budget debt of local governments, uh, the rise of local protectionism, um, the problem of zombie companies, and um, the chronic overinvestment and ultimately overcapacity in many industries, most notably infrastructure and housing, right? Those are exactly the set of challenges that the Chinese policymakers nowadays are trying to tackle with. But none of them has any easy solution. Uh, this leads to the second point I wanted to make, which is about the state of the private sector, the title of our uh, event today. Uh, I think uh, the recent episode about this businesswoman uh, in Guizhou being arrested simply for trying to recoup unpaid fees from a local government in Guizhou is very telling. Um, she is a government contractor. Uh, the contract has been fulfilled. Construction is completed, but she has not got her money. And she was arrested even after a lo the local court had ruled that the local government needs to repay. I think this, this episode is a very vivid illustration of the kind of challenges that the Chinese private sector, especially those smaller ones, the ones that are more distantly connected to the state, uh, are facing today. Uh, for one, you know, it reminds us of the fact that actually, you know, uh, a lot of local government debt, especially including LGFB debt, are actually owed to private companies. And uh, the deteriorating fiscal situation of many local governments is also undermining uh, private uh, sector's confidence. So I think any serious government effort in trying to restore confidence really needs to include sorting out the issue of local debt and making sure that missed payment uh, to private companies are paid. And second, and with, which is more important, which uh, is the fact, the problem that we know for a long time, which is the weak rule of law and weak protection of property rights, right? Without those necessary infrastructure, how can we um, expect um, private entrepreneurs to uh, have that kind of confidence that is needed in making long-term investment uh, and planning. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Tianlei. Really, really helpful evaluation of what this means going down to the government, local government level, and the challenges economically and the complexity of trying, if one ever wanted to think about disentangling all of this, the impossibility of doing that. Joyce, uh, you provide research for thousands and thousands of institutional investor clients and others trying to make sense of China's economy, people that are located all over the world. Uh, we've tried to take a very complex, deep in the weeds issue and make it intelligible for people and uh, who aren't, don't work on China. Uh, how do you evaluate all of this and how should the investment community, your clients and others be looking at this? Does this give people more pause about investing in China? Or is it too complex and other things matter more? Let's, I'd love to get your thoughts on all this. Um, thank you so much, um, Scott, and wonderful to be with all of you. And I really appreciated this discussion because we tell all of the investors we talk to that there's just a lot of oversimplification that's going on that you can really not describe China as state capitalism or you know, or socialism. It really is much more of a hybrid model. And so I want to sort of point out, you know, sort of three challenges and sort of two policy observations. Well, first, we have seen that um, because there is so much focus, as Ilaria mentioned, on um, the industrial policy, on these new investment regimes and investment restrictions. I mean, we have seen FDI flows um, come down to a 26-year low. 
and we've seen portfolio flows. I mean, just last year alone, from foreign ownership of bonds and equities, that was in the order of two hundred and forty billion. And this has made you know the state policy um, much more important as we've seen some of these. Um, outflows. But three points. There is that, first of all, you have in China, there's this dilemma of political centralization, but economic decentralization, which is, I think, very hard for investors um, to grapple with and to um, you know, you know, understand. And then I think the second thing is, and very much what Ken Lei talked about, it's the role of the local government officials. Um, the local government officials um, you know, have a real incentive to pursue policy priorities to build these partnerships, which were so well articulated by Professor Xie. Um, you know, and, um, but also trying to track this is very difficult. So we saw sort of the first shoe of that with the real estate sector to drop off the local government financing vehicles. But I think the next domino that you could really have to look at is just much more difficulties in the regional banks. And these are not the systemically important banks in China, but you know the regional banks. There's 4,300 regional banks, and that's like 87 percent of GDP in China. That's the next one that you could try to do. The distracting this because it is so decentralized. It is private. I wouldn't say that I would necessarily um, end partnerships, but I wouldn't necessarily. But it's also creating these imbalances as well. And then the third point I would make is that when we actually take a look at the flows, um, what we see is that China is really trying to nurture back some of these private flows after the regulatory crackdown, where you saw some real outflows. And if I can try to just share one slide and how we try to characterize um, you know, some of this, uh, but let me just see if I can pull it up. I don't know if that's coming up or not. Did that come up or not? So if, if you can take a look at this slide, but we've actually divided this into state holding, shareholding, the foreign ownership, and also the private flows. And what you can see is this real surge um, you know, at the height of the pandemic. And then you can actually see very much as some of the comments point out that we've had in the state holding, some of this is not profitable, it's come down, and you see this tick up in the private um, numbers that have been become more apparent um, in 2023. So you know that is just really to highlight some of the points that the um, you know speakers you know made that um, just is it all about the state? Is there any private activity? But we do have this hybrid model that is in play in China right now, and the way that we also try to categorize some of these flows because it is so complicated. So I really appreciated this researcher just adding more to um, you know these um, the dimensions. Um, but let me just uh, uh, just you know take that off right now, um, you know, and come back to just some final comments on the policy implications. Um, I think that first, uh, very much, um, you know, uh, uh, agreeing with some of the points that were made earlier, we're in an era where we're going to see more industrial policy. And I think this is, um, Scott and I have talked about this, the lull before the storm that could be coming in 2025 after the elections. So it will be even more important um, to sort of these distinctions and nuances and how they play into policy, because we've seen a drop in um, VC and PE investment from foreigners that's more than 50%. Um, the second point um, that I would also make um, and made earlier today is that um, we still haven't seen this being you know, directed to being consumption led. All of the investment flows and that increase in state activity has been on industrial policy. Um, and so the um, the the um, so that has uh, really um, you know had an impact on um, foreigners really asking the question that China going to a consumption led model and rebalancing its economy are we going to see that bigger objective really come to fruition? So China has been repriced by foreign investors who many of them there's been a stealth recovery actually in the markets are looking at it as much more of a value trade than a mainstream trade until they see greater transparency. But I think gaining a better understanding of the structure and not labeling it so categorically as you know, state-owned versus anti-private sector you know, is just a very important part of this dialogue. Well, thank you very much, Joyce. Everyone, you've, you've contributed a lot to uh, fleshing out some of the implications of, of, of this research. I want to go back to Chang Tai. Um, I want to give you a second to respond to some of the things that you've heard, but I also want to throw in one question that we've gotten from the audience about the sources of this. The discussion so far 
sounds like this is basically a domestic Chinese political economy story for the most part. Uh, Camille mentioned possibly there might be some international factors, but I was wondering, to what extent has growing tensions between China and the rest of the world, and going back maybe to the trade war, which started in 20, late 2017, 2018, does that create any type of incentives in China, China system for this greater interlocking and connectivity that we're seeing? Or is this really primarily a, a domestic Chinese story? Chang Tai. Quick answer. I, I think it is primarily a domestic Chinese story. I, I don't think that the trade war has really changed much. I, I think that the I, I think it just like if I think about sort of the main effect of the trade war and then by more than the trade war, uh, the export restrictions that were put in place on semiconductors. And I guess it was in October of 2022, right? October 2022, that just allowed the party to say, look, I was right all along that the U.S. fundamentally is hostile to us and wants to. And once, I, I mean, my sense is that that has been the way that the senior people, the party, have thought about the U.S. for a long, long time, uh, for a long time, and and I think the trade war and the export restrictions just reinforce that um, message. I think to the the central question in my mind is first about the U.S. is given that nothing a state, nothing. I guess the issue with, with I'm going to say, American policy and, and the way that we think about it is that we think that if you're a private company, the implicit assumption is that if you're a private company, all you care about is making money, right? And if you're a stay-owned company, you don't care about making money. You have political goals. You have political goals, and then that's the way that you know, I, I think that a lot of our policy is organized. But then the question that, that arises is, you know, what if the wealthy private or, or the owners of the largest and, and the most profitable companies are the equivalent of the, are the equivalent of a citizen king? That is, they all suppose that they also have political goals. The both of that, and so maybe to just, uh, ho hopefully this analogy doesn't offend anybody. Suppose that you believe that Elon Musk is crazy, like, and and that Elon Musk, you know, has whatever has certain views of the world. If Elon Musk has no money, it doesn't matter, right? It it, it doesn't matter. But suppose that you know, that that his company makes a lot of money, and with that money comes power, right? And with power, and 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 he has, and then there are certain political things that he can now do once he has money that he couldn't do when he did not have money. Then how does that think how we think about his companies, right? Uh, okay. it, it, that, that, it, is it possible that you can make the choice even though you are just dying to buy that Tesla? Uh, you say, well, you know, I'm going to just forego buying this Tesla. I'm, I'm going to sacrifice uh, and, and, buy the, and buy the next best thing because I don't want to hand over my money to Elon Musk uh, because, I, because I'm afraid of what he is going to do politically to me uh, with the money that I give to him, and I think that's the central tension. I, 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 I think that we, I, I, I don't think we really have grappled with uh, it in terms of, uh, of, 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 in terms of, of, of uh, American uh, policy. Sure. Sure. Last thing I want to say is that in terms, uh, Scott, I, I, I interrupted you. You, you're about to say something. Go ahead. Go ahead. You okay. want to make some more point? Go ahead. And, and, and then in terms of China, right now, just to go back to the point about it primarily being a domestic, a domestic thing, I, I think that what they would really love is that they really would love to have. Uh, let, let me just call it political control so i mean it's a, i mean I, I don't need to say this to this panel but 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 sometimes people forget that the communist party is a leninist party it, it's a it's a, a, a 
it, 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 it's a Leninist party. And, and what I mean by that is, is that for them, not having complete control over all the sectors of society, and that, that is everything, is is viewed as a threat. Uh, it, it, it's it's viewed it's viewed as a threat, but then, which involves uh, private businesses as well, right? right? But but it's but then the question is, part of the part of the strength of the party, also a, a very important part of the strength of the party, also comes from the fact that it can tell its citizens or it can make the claim to its citizens that I've been able to deliver four decades of rapid economic growth. And I think that there's a widespread recognition that you cannot do that with private, well, sorry, with a state-owned firms, right? So, I and, and I think part of what I see them struggling with, you know, in the last five or so years is figuring out how to square that circle. Like, uh, how, you know, how do you get back to the Leninist structure or to have the control of the Leninist structure, but not kill off the private sector at the first, uh, uh, at the same time, right? And it's, the, and, and part of it, uh, and that I think is is the main tension that they're, that, that they're facing. I, I think this view that they want an economy that is state control, I, I, I think that that's just not, Right. I mean, it, it's it's not right. What they want is the political control. They want the political control, but and, and then and their dream is to have a system where they have complete political control, but at the same time they have a dynamic private sector. That I think is their dream. And the question is well, whether that is a pipe dream or, or, or whether that is possible. Uh, okay. So I'll end there. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've just got a, a, a few minutes left, and I wanted to ask one question. Uh, first, and then uh, turn to Alaria to wrap things up on the on the policy front. Uh, but for the others, uh, the question I, I wanted to ask gets to um, who's uh, the relationship between the private firm and the, the SOE. Uh, some of the folks watching will be familiar with a Chinese auto company called Neo or Weilai Chicha, uh, which was started about eight or nine years ago. Very good cars. Uh, listed uh, in the U.S. Uh, and a few years ago, they were facing a cash crunch. Uh, and they went to the Hefei government uh, in Anhui, which invested 40% into this company. All right. So to some extent, what you see are private companies looking for capital. And sometimes they turn to state-owned firms or state-owned investors. But sometimes, as in the case that uh, Chang Tai presented, you have local governments looking like venture capitalists, looking to invest even in companies that may not be looking to be invested in. <clears throat> What's the implications for China's growth trajectory um, based on these two things? What do we expect this whole trend to be? We've seen China's economy slow down. Um, is this story of the greater move toward a hybrid economy where there's more connections between private and state-owned another nail in the coffin of a high growth economy or even a moderately uh, well growing economy? Or might this actually be a way in which to give greater incentives to state owned, to state connected parts of the institution to be more interested in profit maximizing? I wanted to see if any of our uh, commentating guests want to offer uh, a thought on, on that. Uh, Camille, Joyce, or Tianlei. Uh, maybe I'll start sure. in a few seconds. And, yeah, all right, perfect, thank you. Um, I think that what you just said is, is very typical, right? Because overcapacity and political allocation of resources by the financial sector has been one of the key vectors of industrial policy in China. And now we've come to a point where that growth model has reached its, its limits. Right, credit growth can't uh, continue as fast as before. And it's not continuing as fast as before, indeed. Um, and um, so far, the solution of the government um, to address the issue has been to allocate those resources to the really key strategic sectors and the new growth models, uh, the, the new growth factors, right? So all this, the se emerging sectors 
such as green technologies and advanced manufacturing, etc., uh, to make up to compensate for um, the other growth drivers that are fading. Um, the, the key issue is that um, I think they're not enough, and there's not even enough demand in China to absorb all of that. Um, and so that is leading to overcapacity um, and um, to the, the trade confrontation issues that I was um, hinting at earlier. So Joyce, maybe I could, how do you see this? Yeah, so maybe I could just add a comment on China's debt burden, because I think a big concern has been the increase in um, you know, fiscal spending, which you know, has gone from what had been a line in the sand from 3% of GDP to 3.8% of GDP, but an augmented fiscal deficit, you know, more all-inclusive that we think is 12 to 13% of GDP. So just last year alone, we think that debt to GDP rose by 12 percentage points of GDP. So there is a cost for this. And this is why I think that even with its investment strategy, you have potential growth that's going lower in China. I mean, could you be more towards, you know, 4% by the end of the decade, three handle, you know, in the next decade? And I think the question is, um, very much as Camille and uh, um, Liz have pointed out, what's the cost of doing this? And so for every success, is there also a failure? So you have this debate actually going on right now um, you know, as you look at sort of the aftermath of the ongoing real estate crisis, but also even looking at electric vehicles where China has overwhelming market share that for every success, is there also a failure? Is that something that's just going to build further down the line, um, increasing the country's liabilities and the debt burden? Sure. Well, today there are 150 Chinese EV makers still in production. Tianlei? Just very briefly, um, when we talk about the private sector in China, it's not only the, the enterprises. There are also hundreds of millions, who individual businesses, family businesses, that are in, we haven't really discussed about. But that group of you know, that group of uh, businesses are very dynamic. You know, they of course suffered a lot during COVID. But last year they were growing uh, very substantially. They employ about 300 million of workers in China. Um, so I think we should also look at how they are doing and what what their dynamism or failure means for the future uh, of the Chinese economy. Ilaria, final thoughts on the policy implications of all of this? Yeah, I was just thinking as we were talking, um, I, I believe everybody on this panel is trained as a China specialist, right? Um, and I think it's remarkable in a way that uh, these days, uh, increasingly, we, you know, we come up to it focusing on China's political economy, uh, the nuance of, of the and the complicated um, environment in which uh, companies operate in China. Uh, and the you know the relationship with the state and how that's driven a China's growth, et cetera. But I think increasingly we have to recognize that this is having an impact internationally, right? These companies are going abroad. We're seeing exports surging in certain industries. We're increasingly seeing the impact also of indigenization policies in China, which are then affecting how foreign companies are are um, you know their operations. And and in addition to that, I, you know as much as I think um, here we would all be fairly comfortable. With admitting that you know there you know what Professor Xie has highlighted right that there that it's not quite useful to think of state uh, owned or private owned in China because it's it's a gray area, you know in 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 legal terms in U.S. law this matters right you know I spend a lot of time thinking about the Inflation Reduction Act and the foreign entity of concern uh, definition depends on state control over uh, over uh, entities over companies right so actually being state ownership is sort of central um, to to uh, to these regulations and I think it's complicating you know the fact that in China we're seeing uh, you know these trends that have always been there but I think have been accelerating in, in some ways I think complicates even further uh, the 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 position of policymakers abroad and so I think that's just uh, you know things to keep in mind, uh, I think that that are going to continue to be on, on, on a lot of people's minds, and I think are going to be continue to be very interesting to follow. Well, thank you, Alari. I think what you, your last point gets to is is that if you can't distinguish between different foreign entities, some of concern and some not of concern, you will end up talking about foreign countries of concern because you can't do that type of due diligence and figure things out, uh, which is really important for because China's uh, doing business in the rest of the world. Others are doing business in China. And we have to have a common language uh, and conceptual uh, metrics uh, in order to be able to deal with each other. And if we can't, it just makes it that much 
harder. I want to thank Chang Tai for his amazing research, the hard work that he's put in over many years, and those of his colleagues uh, around the world who he's collaborated with. I want to thank Alaria and uh, Ryan and others on our team for the feature that they issued yesterday that further elaborates on this work, uh, explains it uh, to the policy community and the public at large. Uh, I want to thank our guests, commentators, Joyce, Camille, Tianlei, for their insights into uh, this challenge. And I want to thank our partners at Stanford, Scott Rosell, and everybody at Sky for their collaboration with Big Data China. I want to thank everybody who's joined us today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with everybody. So wherever you are on the, in the world, have a great day.